Okay, welcome, Jackie. Um, I'm so glad that you're here. We just had a bit of a chat about setting us up for today and having a really powerful conversation. Um, I would love for you to introduce yourself. Um, I know that you're an attorney actually that was right down the street from where I practice. And when I learned about you and met you, I thought I need to refer people to you because I think that you have it together and you understand parents and you understand the journey that they're going through when they are in one of the most high conflict stressful, anxiety-ridden situations that they are ever going through in their lives. Um, and so welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. It's such an honor to be with you. I know we're so like-minded in our approach to dealing with families and people that are going through conflict. And a lot of times, I think when people go to you or come to me, they're already hardwired to fight. And there's already those negative communication patterns are there and they need help in, in dealing with that. Uh, so I am a family law attorney. My name is Jackie Harunian. I'm the managing partner of Whistleman Harunian Family Law. And we're one of the largest matrimonial practices uh, in the New York area. Uh, and we really do try to work with uh, couples and individuals that try to resolve conflict. It's not going to work in every case. There are some cases that do have to go into court. But I really believe that if parties will choose mediators, because we do mediation too, or attorneys that will encourage conflict resolution, they're going to have a better chance at achieving really good, healthy co-parenting, because that's what it's really all about. Um, and we can talk about the many reasons and the different strategies to get there. Uh, but obviously, this is a conversation that needs to be promoted. People need to realize that there's an option to getting through custody and divorce that does not involve fighting, that does not mean that one party is the victim and the other party is the aggressor. It's much more of a healthy, sharing, new family dynamic. And for the, for the parties that really get that and understand that and are encouraged to go that route by uh, professionals like you and by me, I, I really think uh, it's a movement that is going to spread because people want that. They just don't know how to get there. Yeah, Jackie, whenever I speak to someone, I'm always you know, thinking about where are they coming from? Because so much of the information that you're talking about is already out there. You can Google about it. You can read books about it. Um, but I like to talk about before we even dive into that. So people understand you are just my perception of you, a very with it together, you get it um, professional and very compassionate. And being that you are in one of the most high conflict, you know, sort of areas in law, right? You're dealing with families that are just, you know, really going through turmoil a lot of the times and in very, very um, difficult and complex situations. How do you um, think about working with people? Just you personally, Jackie, when you are working with high conflict and you know you have to get that result for the benefit of the family, for the benefit of the children involved, if there are, what is your thinking? Because you are firm, but you're also very loving and compassionate. And I think that well, the know, of the two is great. I appreciate that. You know, I'm, I have a family too. I, my husband and I have four children. I have raised four teenagers. I've been married a very long time. And I'm, I'm very understanding of conflict because I've lived through it. I know there are no perfect parents. Even the most perfect parents have children that sometimes have challenges. And so I really get it from an ins as an insider's view. Uh, whenever, whenever a client comes to me, uh, I really need to have an understanding of what's driving them, um, you know, whether they have any mental health issues of their own, what their risk factors are, because going into court and even launching a custody battle is not a joke, especially with teenagers. Uh, every positive and negative is going to be laid bare for a court, for child protective proceedings, for social workers, for forensic evaluators. It's not something I would want anyone to go through unless it's absolutely necessary. And so what that means is we have to take a step back. We have to take a look and see what the laws are. The laws are very much in favor of joint custody. And 80 to 90% of parents are going to start with that expectation. And that's where the law is right now. And I'm talking from New York uh, mm -hmm. law. It's very similar in other states as well. People have to understand, especially coming at the end stage of a pandemic, mothers and fathers were raising their children at home, in a lot of cases together in very small quarters. Uh, the children were remote schooling, parents were working from home or not. And we have now mothers and fathers that have very specific opinions and views about how children should be raised. Uh, a lot of uh, you know, medical issues, academic issues, and parents have to hear each other. 
because both parents have rights. And as children get older, and by older, I mean 11, 12 years old, and if they're vocal about what they want, they certainly have rights. Mm -hmm. So it's very important for everyone to listen to each other and understand that there's enormous benefits to resolving conflict out of court. Uh, you know, as parents, what's best for your children far better than a judge uh, or a social worker uh, or attorney for a child, as well-meaning as they are, I have to tell you, the court system is maxed right now. The judges have never had so many cases on their dockets. We're dealing with very uh, you know, contested cases right now. A lot of cases dealing with domestic violence and child abuse and relocation cases and COVID specific cases. I mean, so the court system is very, very limited right now in what it can do. And that's all the more reason to avoid it if you can. And, and really work with professionals that are going to try to get you through a crisis, hopefully towards collaborative co-parenting that feels not perfect, but workable for the family and understand that changes are gonna keep happening six months out, a year out. No custody agreement is ever final because children change, their needs change and parents change. They might move on to other relationships or they might have other things that come up. And so this is a working relationship. It's very important to not start out with this framework that's adversarial because then God forbid, you're gonna be one of those families that's duking it out in family court uh, you know, until your children age out. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's not good either. Um, you know, you, as we all know, teenagers have specific challenges and problems. And when you when you have a divorce, you have battling parents, it, it definitely makes it worse, much harder on children, mm -hmm. for sure. Something you said that was so important, and I want to just highlight is we talk about capacity, you know, how do you have the capacity to even deal with the situation right now? And let's try to help build it. And you just said the court system is taxed. It's maxed out as far as what it can do. So if we think about a system that has no capacity to really focus because they're overwhelmed, you're right. The decisions that strangers, regardless of how amazing we are at what we do, their ability to make decisions for your family, right, are not better than your own ability to do so. And so you're saying if people can do it on their own um, and find a way, then that is best. So Jackie, what is, in your opinion, because again, you've seen it all, what is the best way to even start eating this elephant? I know it's one bite at a time, but it, it looks like, it, I mean, when you've got conflict on both sides, and like you said, disagreement, where do you begin? You know, I think, you know, a lot of attorneys and judges, we kind of joke uh, that these parties chose each other. They chose to make each other parents in most cases. You know, we didn't create that scenario. You did. You chose this partner to have this child with. And now that person is going to be in the child's life. And it comes from re recognizing that it's a very good thing for a child to have access to both parents and access to extended families on both sides. And maybe even a step parent that can be wonderful and give love to a child. Wouldn't you want your child to have more resources, more love? And what can you do to foster that? Because I know in your system, love is a part of it. It's mm -hmm. having that feeling of generosity that this is a child that's going to be raised without toxicity, without anger. And I need to put down my own negative feelings and promote the, the relationship that the child has with the other parent. I'm not talking about 100% of the time. I wanna be very careful to say, this is 80 to 90% of the time where joint custody is healthy and should be promoted and, and maximize the child's relationship with the other parent. Uh, in 10% in of the time, or maybe even more, it's not healthy to promote it. We have cases where children really need to be protected from a parent. There could be violence or substance abuse or other things. So this is not a cookie cutter approach. I am talking though to the majority of parents that need to really shift from a husband and wife perspective or we're living together and now we're breaking up and really adopt a co-parenting perspective which this child has two parents. Uh, you know, Both parents are probably working. That's the reality for most households. And so now we're gonna have this child living potentially in two households uh, and is gonna have uh, another parent to call in the event of an emergency, another parent who might have an opinion in the event of an academic or medical issue. And, and that's a good thing. 
Mm -hmm. And this is really a, a big shift in our culture where it used to be that parenting was very much the domain of mothers. And that's just the way it was. These were the gender roles that were very fixed. Mm -hmm. I remember I'm thinking back to when my child was born, my first child 30 years ago, the mom had the domain of the children and the fathers sort of backed off. That is not the reality anymore. Mm -hmm. That is not what the law says anymore. The laws are gender neutral and you have same sex relationships too. In most cases, a child is going to have more than one caregiver, uh, maybe even grandparents or other family members or step parents. And it's very important to have that generosity and that feeling of this child is going to be raised uh, by not just me, but other people that love this child. And uh, when I talk to moms, many times uh, they're very resistant to joint custody. They've been raising the children you know, during the marriage, they, you know, gave up their career or had a lot of sleepless nights doing everything that moms do for children. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard for them to accept that it's not going to be like that in a divorce or a separation, the child is going to have joint custody, and is going to be living probably in two households, to some degree, the moms that that really accept that and move with that in a healthy way, learn to really love it most of the time they realize how great it is to have a night or two a week when the child is not with you and you get to recharge and maybe focus on a career or go out with friends or just get some extra sleep. A lot of them will privately admit that joint custody really is something that they like. Mm -hmm. And we're getting to the point where I have moms that say, I wish the father would take more time with the child. I would like to have, especially during the teenage years, I want more time to myself. So this is a big cultural shift because 10 years ago, I never heard mom say that. The children were their domain and they were going to take care of everything and the fathers uh, weren't as involved as they are now. Jackie, what an interesting paradigm shift that's occurring because I think that it also has to do with an identity shift in terms of what it means to be a parent, what it means to be a mother, what it means to be a father. And this leads me to ask this, when parents, you say, accept it, you know, and they learn to like it. And then they admit that they like it. And they, and they like the benefits of, you know, having some time to themselves and maybe the other parent having their own space and time with the child and how healthy that can be. This leads to this, this idea that how are we shifting in our understanding of parenthood roles. And, and you are a perfect person to ask because you're in that space of just watching as it's happening, where someone is going from, I'm a full-time parent and this is my responsibility and this is how it should be because we get all of the expectations and assumptions of how it should be from our own parents, from our own culture. And now you're seeing the shift tell me a little bit more about it. Is it interesting? Is it, is it, it, it is really it, is. It's interesting because I come from a very traditional background myself. My parents were Middle Eastern immigrants and yeah. I'm a traditional person in many ways, quite conservative in many ways, but I am seeing over the past 25 years during my career, this real shift in how, uh, like you said, identity, a lot of moms, they hold on, they held on to this sole custody paradigm. These are my children. I raised them. The husband needs to go earn and pay support. And it really created this dependent paradigm where women really continued as caregivers for many years after a separation or divorce and were financially dependent. Mm -hmm. It's not like that anymore at all. Uh, fathers are willing to give up career and income opportunities in order to be more active fathers. I'm seeing it. Uh, they're not as motivated uh, financially as they were before. And women are more motivated financially than ever. I have more CEO moms, breadwinner moms, which is so exciting for me. I really think it's about time. Probably a third of the moms that walk into my office earn the same or more than their spouse. And obviously that has an effect on how things play out. Uh, for a woman that does have a career that has an identity uh, separate from being a mom or has volunteer work or other interests outside of just the mom role, uh, it is an extraordinary opportunity to actually trust your co-parent, know that there's someone who's going to be able to be there for the children in the event you have to travel or in the event you have something going on in your career or you want to get remarried. Um, you know, letting go of that fixed identity as, as just the mom and I don't want to say just the mom, because it is a very important role. But we all know children grow up. They leave the nest. 
you know, at age 18 or sometimes younger, sometimes older, that mom role is still going to be there. I'm certainly still an active parent for my children over age 18. But, you know, there's a lot of life left to live. There's other opportunities that men and women can take advantage of. Mm-hmm. And, and letting go of that role, that sole custody, that primary custody, it does start with the separation process. You have to trust your co-parent. There are many parents that have to put their children in childcare for the very first time. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is a letting go process. Mm-hmm. And, and, and it really, it is an evolution that I do see. Yeah. And thankfully yeah. I do see parents get comfortable with it. And many, many who tell me that once the lawyers and judges and courts were out of the picture, they had an easier time um, communicating. Uh, and it, it, does, it does take trust and forgiveness to make that happen. And recognizing, again, you're not a perfect parent. There might be things the other parent does better or does well enough so that you can let go and see what else life has to offer. Mm-hmm. You, you talk about so many important concepts, the permission to let go of what you think it should be like. Uh, the permission to just kind of look within and say, what do I really want? Instead of what do people, you know, think that it should be like? And this is a huge paradigm shift in our culture. Absolutely, Jackie. So when it comes to actually communicating and you wrote a book and I'd love for you to just share um, a little bit about your, you know, inspiration to write it and and share your your knowledge with everyone. But also when it comes to communication, what are some things that you're seeing as the most vital um, that people really need to work on that maybe when they were married or in their marriage, they didn't, but now it's vital for them to to have in their back pocket in order to get through this process alive. (laughs) Yeah, so I wrote a book uh, about five years ago. It's called Divorce Reality Check. I'm holding Mm -hmm. it up right here. I think the filter's It's available on Amazon. It's very inexpensive. And um, I wrote the book because um, there was a very dramatic change in the law approximately 10 years ago that resulted in no-fault divorce. As I mentioned, gender-neutral custody laws, Mm -hmm. uh, much more defined laws on child support, spousal support, the division of assets. And what I was finding is that the moms especially were getting blindsided. So my book is called Reality Check. It's very, very important when people are going through a custody or divorce situation that they get accurate legal advice. And uh, when you have that accurate sense of what the law is, it's gonna be so much easier to resolve your issues because there's a high level of predictability on how these cases play out in court. Mm -hmm. Uh, one One of the changes is, for example, that a lot of times people have to pay their own legal fees. If there is a breadwinner, the breadwinner is probably gonna lay out the initial uh, amount of legal fees, but a lot of the other legal fees is gonna come out of your own pocket. Mm. And why would you want to enrich your attorney when you really should be watching your own money, it's caveat emptor, avoid a legal battle for financial and emotional reasons. And a lot of other things that have changed in the law that it's important for people to know about. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I think we're at a time where information is very, very available. It's very accessible. There's almost like too much information out there. But um, everyone has to be uh, really responsible for the advice they seek out and how they uh, really effectuate their divorce or custody strategy. Uh, As I said, the law is more fair than ever. Mothers and fathers have a very equal shot um, when it comes to custody. And when it comes to communication, as 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 I said to you earlier, a lot of times people are coming to me or to you in a very dysfunctional mode. Uh, they're hardwired for conflict. There's fighting, there's yelling. There might be police or orders of protection. Uh, Obviously that's not good, it's not healthy and it can really get people into trouble. I always tell clients when they come to me, assume you're being taped, assume your ex is gathering evidence on you. I mean, just look at what's going on with Johnny Depp and Amber Heard and so easy to collect evidence against an adversary. And uh, you know, it can be used in, in really, really unfair ways in court. So just from a strategy standpoint, really be careful of communication. I always tell my clients- Before before you even go into that, because you just touched on something so important that you mentioned to me before, victim mentality. You know, I'm gonna say it because a lot of times people are victimized and people are put in a position to um, feel demoralized in their marriages, their situations for a very, very long time. And it becomes insidious in nature. And when 
this actually reaches a point, you know, ahead, it's like, I'm victim. And we become really connected to it. Before you even get into the communication strategy and your top tips, what would you say about that? Because the letting go of victim mentality, I think is so important here, isn't it? It really is. And um, I understand that I'm actually, um, have supported domestic violence victims. Uh, and to this day, my firm helps domestic violence victims. This is not to say that there isn't, there aren't victims out there. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you're in a relationship that's toxic or harmful, whether it's verbal abuse or physical abuse, God forbid, or anything else, you need to find ways to leave that relationship. It's just not a good thing for you or your children. Mm -hmm. However, once you're going through a legal process, and it is a process, there's a lot of steps to get to the end point. Um, you have to really have a legal strategy that's, like I said, based on what the law is eventually going to impose on your family. And by the law, I mean the judge and uh, the other people that are involved in making decisions about you and your family. If you're going to see everything through a victim lens, you're going to make mistakes. Um, if, you, if you need to get an order of protection, by all means, get one. But understand that there are always two sides to the story. There's a lot of people that are not truthful when they go through court proceedings. And everyone has their own subjective reality about what the relationship was like. Uh, there are men and women who both feel victim, like the, they're victims. Um, certainly, you know, women are not um, always looked at as deserving of protection. A lot of times they are seen as the aggressor. There are many women that got arrested during the pandemic because of domestic violence and uh, the police came and the mom threw her cell phone and she ends up arrested. There are a lot of things that potentially can get people in trouble. Um, the victim thing, really, you, you need legal advice, you need mental health um, support, uh, you need to move past it and understand that there's going to be a joint custody result in almost all circumstances. And if you do feel victimized by your ex, then you need to communicate, not face to face. Maybe you don't need to be on the phone with each other. Maybe it can be done through email. I love email. It's a great way to protect yourself and copy your lawyer if you need to, or collect evidence if necessary for a future court proceeding. But there are also amazing apps out there. Um, Family Wizard is one of them. There are others where people that don't communicate well or who have a negative history can at least have a tool to share information with each other. Uh, it's very, very important to do that. You have to share information to co-parent effectively. You have to share information about what the doctor said or what the teacher is saying or what's going on with your child. Mm -hmm. uh, and even in cases where there are orders of protection and actual domestic violence, that doesn't mean you don't have an obligation to share information about your child. And so communication is incredibly important. Uh, the parents that sign on to that and really get better at communicating uh, have much better results uh, when it comes to um, outcomes in their custody and divorce situations. And playing the victim, you know, abusing the court system, trying to paint your partner in a negative light uh, does not work in many cases. At a certain point, the court system is going to move forward with custody outcomes. And if you're seen as someone who's alienating or exaggerating or has mental health issues relating to being a victim, it, it's going to hurt your case. So it's yeah, important yeah. to get advice on that. You're with this person for the rest of time if you have children with them. And so thinking about, you know, I always say it's like emotional intelligence, fast forward ahead about 10 years you're still parenting alongside these people, right? Their family and them um, and needing to think ahead, right? When you are, and, and there are many times where people are being victimized and things are going on, right? And, and that needs to be documented. It needs to be monitored and, and, and evidence needs to be, you know, placed in front of, you know, um, whoever, you know, in the court system. But we're talking more about, um, you know, situations where people feel like something wasn't fair in the marriage or something really did happen and they were, you know, um, kind of blindsided and they're angry. We're talking about holding on to anger, resentment, and emotions that in the long run are not going to serve yourself or your child, especially if you have to co-parent together. I mean, that's 100% right. I mean, listen, there are a lot of people that come to me, they've been cheated on mm -hmm. or money went missing mm -hmm. or a real betrayal in a relationship. I mean, that is very... You have it justified to feel angry, uh, but that can't be the story a month or six months or a year from now that only harms your child. You have to process that, get past that, understand there's another side to the story, 
a lot of times with infidelity, there really are two sides. It's not always just one party that uh, is completely in the right. Um, and you know that is a more nuanced view of long-term relationships. But when it comes to co-parenting, I always tell my clients, do you wanna be that family when your child is graduating from high school that is seething with anger on opposite sides of the stadium, uh, you know, not enjoying the moment? Or do you wanna be that family that has moved on successfully from divorce, can actually stand together, cheering on your child, being happy, being in a group picture? That is possible for everyone. You really do have to let go though of a lot of uh, anger and victimhood and, and things where you never really got the validation you deserved. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the court system is not going to necessarily deliver that to you either. It really does take a radical forgiveness that mm -hmm. for the sake of my child, I'm going to be happy and wish the best for my co-parent because that's good for my child. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a lot of people can get there with the right coaching, but so much that. of that is just internal. You really have to be willing to do the work. You just said it. It is so starting starting with us. It starts with the, with with the parent, and it trickles down. You know, so many parents, and they come in and they'll say, "I need support for my child," and it's always, and it's not a blame. It's an empowerment of, we first need to get you fed, your needs met, you nourished, you right, and then your child will just follow suit because they're living in your environment. You are the environment. So what you're saying is that. You know, it has to come from over here and then everything will, will kind of fall into place. Jackie, what are some of the things that you see in terms of communication that are big no-nos? You know, um, the Gottmans who are very, very well-known couples, um, you know, therapists, but also experts, you know, talk about the four angry horsemen. Um, but what are your top no-nos for, you know, communication and their antidotes? And what do you suggest? I mean, I think, first of all, communication is a skill that everyone has to learn, whether you're in a good marriage or not a good marriage or relationship, uh, negative communication is eventually going to be picked up by your children and then your teenagers are going to learn those habits. So it's important that you learn ground rules for communication, that if things escalate, you have to be able to say, listen, this is not productive. Let's continue this conversation later mm -hmm. and learn to walk out of the room before things get crazy. You have to learn to agree to disagree with your co-parent that we're not agreeing on this point. Um, let's revisit this conversation later or let's get some information from a child's teacher uh, or a doctor or the mortgage bank or whatever the issue is. Let's regroup. Uh, and, and I think an email can be a very effective tool because I think texting gets people in trouble. Mm -hmm. screenshots, uh, you know, phone conversations or face-to-face -face conversations, all of those have a potential to really uh, get people into the point where police are going to get called. And th it's not necessary. Mm -hmm. If you really are at an impasse, you really cannot agree with a co-parent, then uh, you need to set very strong boundaries and avoid communication or bring in someone, a mediator, uh, a therapist, someone who can help break that impasse. Mm -hmm. um, I love the gray rock method. I, I, are you familiar with it? The gray rock mm -hmm. method of if someone is abusive, narcissistic, really belittling you or a problem in your life, you have to really disengage. Um, and you can, you can get better at it with practice. Mm -hmm. The more you learn to disengage from negative people or toxic people, set those very firm boundaries, the less and less it takes up your mental space mm -hmm. as you go through your day and deal with your life. Yeah. Whereas if you're constantly engaging with someone negative, uh, it can really become a, an obsessive thing where it's constantly punch and counterpunch and text and negativity. And, you know, it, it, this anger really fuels people. It brings them to lawyers. And I have to talk a lot of people down from filing petitions or escalating issues. There are better ways of dealing with these things than going to court. As I mentioned before, the court barely has the time to deal with the more serious cases. Mm -hmm. So it's important to learn to retreat from these angry emotions and find a better way to communicate if possible. Disengaging yeah. is a very good one. Yeah, you're speaking to a great amount of people who obviously got into this, these relationships with partners who do have some challenges with their own ability to relate to others. And so we do see a lot of manipulation, a lot of, you know, 
fishing for and making bids for, you know, um, attention. And it does, it takes a lot to disengage and create boundaries that are healthy. Um, and, and yeah, it, it's, it's a lot. So when you've said this many, many times in our conversation, which is it's really important to find the right people to do your homework and do your due diligence and try to stay away from the court system and making the decisions. So Jackie, I've got so many people who get married, me, myself, I got married. I never thought I'd get divorced. I had no idea about, you know, um, what lawyer to call. Thank goodness my lawyer was a darling and amazing. We didn't have much to, to really argue about. Um, and the divorce was pretty um, seamless, but how do people, find, how, how do you filter? You know, I have, as a therapist, I can, I wrote an ebook about it. I can tell you how to find the right therapist for you. What are your top tips, maybe three tips on having people find the right lawyer for them? Right. Very important. It, it makes a big difference how a case plays out, the lawyer that you choose or the law firm that you choose. I think it's important to interview several. And by interview, I mean, at the very least, a Zoom or go into their office face to face. Mm -hmm. I would say at least three. And the best way to get a lawyer is by referrals. Ask other friends uh, who they used, who they mm -hmm. were happy with. Uh, there's a lot of Facebook moms and, and groups where people make recommendations. And you should do your research. Uh, your, your lawyer should have at least, I would say, 10 years of experience. They okay. should know how to uh, litigate or if you just want to use a mediator, uh, very good referrals for a mediator. There are some good ones out there. Uh, and you're going to click with uh, someone, I think, at some point. You're going to find the one that matches what you're looking for. If you go to a lawyer that tells you, we're going to go to court, we're going to fight, I'm going to get you sole custody, you're going to get top dollar support, beware. Beware, that lawyer is going to uh, escalate the case from the beginning, drive up legal fees. That might feel good. A lot of people in the beginning of their case, they want a warrior. They want an attorney who's really going to decimate the other side. But imagine what you're really launching. You're launching a war that could take a year or two or three and empty out your bank accounts and leave you with very unhappy children that are in the middle of a war. Mm -hmm. It takes so much more self-control to work with a lawyer that says, listen, this is what is likely to happen in your case. This is what I recommend. Let's try to keep the case out of court. Because um, if you choose a lawyer like that, it's much more likely your, attorney, your, your ex is also going to choose a lawyer to keep a case out of court. We all know the lawyers that fight and litigate. If you hire one, your ex is going to hire one, and, and you're going to end up with the result that, frankly, you deserve, if that's really how you started your case. There are many cases that start out of court and unfortunately, for whatever reason, need to go into court. Mm -hmm. um, but 95% of cases settle before trial. Most people are not going to go to trial. Mm -hmm. They're going to settle their case. The only question is, is when. Mm -hmm. So definitely interview several lawyers. And you will. there are a lot of lawyers that practice divorce law, especially in New York. You're going to find the right one. It's easy to do research online um, and, and hire someone who specializes in family law. Those are my top tips. What are a couple of questions that people should ask their lawyers while they're interviewing them? Aside from the ones that are, you know, the obvious ones, what are some telltales, you know? Like, for example, for me, if a therapist says, you know, um, you know, I, I will be really cheeky, Jackie, and I will say, you know, do you do your own work? You know, do you do your own coaching or personal development work? And if the person says no, or they're kind of, you know, stunned at the question, um, I politely pass, you know, because I can't go deep with someone if they can't go deep with me, right? right. Um, so for you as, as a, what does your sixth sense say when, you know, ask them? I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, the biggest problematic cases, and that's why I wrote the book, Divorce Reality Check, are usually women or men that have never seen a tax return, that mm -hmm. have, don't understand the finances of their marriage, have very unrealistic expectations, and uh, they expect their attorney to, to get things that are just not possible. So I have to screen for that in the, in the, in the initial interview. I'm gonna, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm interviewing a client the same way they're interviewing me. I would like to work with people that are reasonable, that are receptive to advice. Um, and the consultation is a time for the attorney and the client to ask each other questions to see if it's a good fit. Uh, I'm not gonna be used as a tool to hurt another parent. I can protect my own client, I have to do the right thing to make sure children are protected as well, but I'm not going to be used to keep a parent from a child or, you know, um, be a, be part of a negative part of the case. So I have to be careful with clients as well. I think you should come to a, 
a meeting with an attorney with a list of questions with your goals defined and ask the attorney, are these realistic? Is this something that you think um, is obtainable in my case and how would you go about it? Uh, you wanna know a little bit of what's going on, what strategy decisions your attorney will make. Mm -hmm. You have to know what things will cost. You have to discuss the retainer, uh, how far that retainer will go. Um, and, and usually I tell clients, if I know who the other attorney is, Mm -hmm. I'm going to have a much better sense of how this case is going to go because the attorneys really do make a very big difference in how a case unfolds. Jackie, if people are in the midst of, you know, the whirlwind, they're, they're in it and time between meetings with you, time between court appearances, all of that is going on. What can people do to keep their calm and keep their cool? A lot of these parents that I'm working with are with their kids on the weekends, they're yeah. you know trying to live their life and do their jobs, and they are anxious. They've never dealt with something like this. They yeah. get. What's your advice on just? I mean, being a party to a lawsuit is very stressful. Mm -hmm. uh, so much more so when it's your own children and your own financial future at stake, and there is a high level of frustration in between court dates. The worst part of the case is it when you're in the middle, when it seems like it's endless. You've already been at it for a few months. There's no finish line in sight. You know, you might feel like your attorney's not doing anything. And what I always tell people is you have to really regard this as a process. It's a marathon. It's, you know, you're at either the beginning or the middle or the end. You have to have the stamina and the staying power to just deal with the fact that the process will eventually end. All cases eventually end. Everyone's entitled to a divorce in a no-fault divorce state like New York. You're going to eventually get there. The question is, can you work with your lawyer, provide documents on time, be realistic about custody outcomes, and make the right compromises for the right reasons, and then your case will get resolved. It is very frustrating. And I'm constantly trying to counsel my own clients about how to deal with that frustration. And having a good therapist is a big part of it, mm -hmm. focusing on your life. Uh, on getting out there, either with your career or meeting new people or being the best parent you can be, your focus has to be on your future. It can't be on your court dates mm. because that's not good. You have to, uh, you know, keep the court dates on your calendar. They're, they're part of your life, obviously, meeting with your lawyer, cooperating with court orders, but that's not your whole life. Your life is in front of you. You have to move forward with it and have the trust and the confidence that your case will eventually settle, as most cases do. If your case is in court, eventually the court is going to put a lot of pressure on the attorneys and the parties to resolve it. That's not going to happen in the first six months of the case. But once a case starts to get a little bit older, the court starts to put a little bit more pressure. Uh, and that's good. Uh, that pressure needs to happen. It doesn't happen at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And not everyone can deal with frustrations that easily. Mm -hmm. So that's where you come in. Yeah, and I, I do love working with people in that stage because they really are, it's so close that they can't see anything beyond what's in the moment. I, one more question and then we'll wrap up. Jackie, if someone is dealing with a uh, partner, um, an ex-partner or, you know, the, 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 the parent of their child that they feel nobody, including their lawyer, gets it, how manipulative, how difficult the personality is they're constantly being berated and you know and this is their perception this is how it occurs for them how do you recommend they you know um they they carry on um especially yeah. when they're focused on so many things in a way where they're documenting no, no i get that i mean listen uh there are people that are really bad out there. There are spouses that are narcissistic or have other issues or are really abusive. What I tell my clients is that's why you're not together anymore. That's why you're divorcing this person. They really are that bad. Sure. Yeah. I get it. I understand. And I want to validate their experience. Yes, yeah. this is yeah. not okay. But if, if this person was so great, you'd probably still be together. You're not together. There are reasons why you're not together. Uh, you could write it all down, keep a journal, keep records if it's important to you. I would rather you not do that. You do still need to, though, let that go and understand that this is still someone that you're raising a child with. Mm. Uh, so hopefully you're not living together anymore. Hopefully you're not subjected to actual abuse in your day to day life. Uh, you do have to compartmentalize it a little bit unless it reaches the point where the other person's actions are affecting your child in a negative way. And then that's something that might be worth pursuing legally. 
But even then, I mean, you're not going to be able to change this person. Whatever the person's issues are, unless it's affecting your child, you really need to process it and move past it. You're not going to change another person. Mm -hmm. You can create really good boundaries, though. Mm -hmm. You don't have to deal with it. Uh, you know, you can mute the text messages. You can avoid interactions um, and still get past it and still co-parent. Yeah. You need some coaching potentially, but don't get obsessed with that. Move, you know, move on to another relationship, another focal point. Don't let your relationship with your ex rob another minute of your well-being and peace of mind. Don't let that happen. Thank you, Jackie. And this is truly the last question um, that okay. I like to ask people um, when I interview them because I think that hindsight is 2020 and it's invaluable. It's twofold for you. Um, because you are not divorced, you are happily married. And so this is not so much for you um, looking back, but twofold, if you were to look back at your younger self lawyer and you had a piece of knowledge that you have now and you wish you had back then, what would you, if you had 20 minutes with younger Jackie when she's first starting out, what would you tell her? What's the pep talk you would have? And the second part of that is if some of your clients collectively were to look back and had 20 minutes with themselves while their this process started, what would they say, do you think? What yeah. do you hear all the time? Yeah, you know, so although I haven't been through a divorce, I've had my own challenges in life, pretty significant ones. And so my advice for myself would be the same I would give to a client, which is that all challenges, including divorce, are temporary. You will get past it. And I would tell my younger self, everything will be okay. Everything will work out. Trust in yourself and understand that you have a long road ahead of you, hopefully help with health, that you can accomplish your goals. And uh, you know, forgiveness and healing towards yourself, towards other people, having compassion, tremendous compassion is a game changer. Mm -hmm. And uh, everything will work out the way it's meant to. Uh, and, and your goal is to have your children in your life beyond just grade school and teenage years and college. You want your children in their 20s and beyond to want to come home to you and for you to be a, a source, a, a resource for the rest of their lives. Um, and, and a lot of that um, you can work on while they're still living with you in your household. Uh, mm -hmm. there's, they're a guest until they're 18 or 19 or whatever year it is. You want them to come home to you and it really is on you to make the right choices and not make it a toxic environment with a co-parent it mm -hmm. does take a lot of discipline and control mm -hmm. but everything else it, it really life is short but life is also long you'll be able to get past your challenges if you have that view yeah i love that i love that so much jackie is there anything i didn't ask that you think is of utmost importance for people to know or do you feel oh. complete I feel complete. I appreciate the opportunity and I know we'll have other conversations. Uh, I really believe in your method in dealing with co-parenting and conflict. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited to see this broadcast and to share with other people in my network. And uh, thank you so much, Victoria. Thank I really you, appreciate Jackie. it. Yeah, I, I, I want to thank you and also just acknowledge you because I think I hear more about um, people in, in, in the the um, in the field of working with those in crisis that um, really do go out to win and be, be warriors. I actually see you as a warrior, but one with an immense heart. Um, and so the marriage of the two is an invaluable resource. And I am always happy to, to refer you and talk about you. So thank you so much for having this that. conversation. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And hopefully this will be part of a movement to do just a better job with parents. Yes. Parenting is rough. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks Have so a much wonderful day. You Take too. care.